this week in the news. Breaking news, the tale of the Somerton Man. The mysterious dead body that was found on Somerton Beach in South Australia in 1948. An unsolved mystery that may now, thanks to modern technology and DNA analysis, and frankly, the persistence of a very determined researcher, be solved. So, on December the 1st, 1948, in Adelaide, Australia, the body of a clean-shaven man wearing a brown suit was discovered on Somerton Beach at around 6.30 in the morning. There didn't appear to be any signs of physical violence, and the body was propped up against, you know, the seawall on the beach. There was no identification on the body, and despite many attempts, officials were never able to identify the man or the cause of death. However, four months after his death, a clue was found in a secret pocket in the man's trousers that led investigators down a rabbit hole of clues and inquiries that would solidify this case as one of the most mysterious of all time. It was a scrap of paper with the words Tamam Should written on it. In Persian, this means it is ended. So who was this unknown man? Let's get into the mystery. It was, it was a bit of an odd one. There was no signs of physical violence and there was no kind of determination of what the actual cause of death was. They found during the autopsy that he had an abnormally large spleen and possibly had internal bleeding, but it didn't look like he was attacked and they couldn't rule out poison as a cause of death. I believe the coroner said the likely cause of death was poison, but they found no traces of any poison. Mm. That was just one mystery in this ever-expanding, mysterious case. So, when this scrap of paper was found four months after the body was discovered, police determined it, it had come from a very rare book called the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, which was an 11th century collection of Persian poems. They also found a suitcase had been checked into the Adelaide's train station the day before the body was found. This suitcase contained various items, including a knife, boot polish, a stenciling brush used on merchant ships, as well as some clothes, most of which, interestingly, had their labels removed. However, whoever removed the labels didn't do a thorough enough job, as written on one of the ties was the name T. Keen. Unfortunately, the police ran a search on the name and found nobody had been reported missing in any English-speaking country with that name T. Keen, so maybe it was a red herring left there on purpose by whoever cut out the labels. We just don't know. We don't even know why they cut out these labels. And there was something else about the clothes as well. With all these clothes, and all the kind of labels being meticulously cut out, the man had packed several outfits, but there just weren't any socks. No socks, which I always found was a, a weird part of the story. Yeah, yeah. Why, yeah. You're packing a a well-dressed you? man with only one pair of socks that he's wearing seems a bit odd. Did you, from based on what they found in the suitcase at this point, do you guys have any theories about who he might have been? Because for me, the the brush stood out. Yeah, I was going to say that's the only clue to any kind of profession. A merchant navy brush would suggest he's in the navy or had been yeah. in the navy. Yeah, I mean, I think this is just it could just be a sailor. Like this is used on merchant ships. Didn't yeah. he also have an unusual coat? Oh, I don't know about the coat. Tell me. I think he had a coat that wasn't available in Australia, but the stitching suggested it was made in America. Okay. However, right. it wasn't imported because they had rec they would have had records of it. Uh, so he somehow got hold of this American coat. Weird. Well, I think all of these points in the mystery just provide more questions than answers at the moment, so investigators had no leads and no idea who was responsible for the man's death, or even who he was. They published details of his death and asked the public to come forward if they knew anything related to the case. Four months after their request, a man walked into the police station with a copy of the book, The Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. At the back of the book, it had a page torn that matched the scrap of paper mm -hmm. found on the body. The man, named John Freeman, claimed he was parked near Somerton Beach on the day the body was found. He discovered the book in his car, but didn't think anything of it until he heard the details of the case, at which point he brought it to the police. Which, you know, I'm happy with that explanation, to yeah. be honest. You wouldn't really go yeah. to the police with a, oh, someone's put a book in my car. Like, that. <laughs> you know, you're not going to go to the police until something comes up. Um, yeah, yeah, no, it's fair enough. It is weird, though, that he just, if that's his book, he takes it with him to the town, but then just tosses it into the back of another person's car randomly. 
whilst he's hidden the relevant bit he's torn out inside his secret pocket in his clothing. I mean, we don't know that yeah. this was him. We don't know that this was the Somerton man who did this. Uh, that's true. This could be an it's assassin true. sending a message. With the identity, you know, the mysterious clothes as well, and potentially being a, an import from America, it could be that he was dressed in these clothes by someone else. Maybe they weren't even his clothes. That's oh, a very good with the labels cut course. out to change, to, you know, to, to not be able to identify them. But anyway. Yeah, you're, you're basically where I think they were thinking at this point, like, Maybe he was a spy. Maybe he was assassinated by a government group or something. The the note is definitely... Is that a suicidal note? It has ended. To me, that seems more like someone sending a message to whoever found the note. Do you know mm. what I mean? Like, it could, If it is a suicide note, it seems like the classiest, most cryptic suicide note you could... It is finished. ...you could give. Yeah. In Persian, from a specific collection of poetry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, and, and hidden. Hidden in his trousers so that nobody knows. The investigation didn't end here because there were more clues in this book. So, on the inside cover of the book was a phone number, as well as what oh. appeared to be a cipher, uh, which I don't believe has ever been solved. However, the phone number did lead investigators to a nurse named Jessie Thompson. She denied knowing the Somerton man, but apparently reacted strangely when she was shown a plaster cast model of his face. One report even said that she nearly fainted and refused to look at the cast again. But I mean, I don't know how much that indicates that she knew him or if she was just freaked out with seeing... Death it's masks bit, it are quite pretty spooky. Creepy. Also, interestingly, she claimed to... She used to own a copy of the Rubaiyat, this book, this very rare book, but had given it to a man named Alf Boxall, a lieutenant during World War II. Hmm. So at this point, investigators yeah. were thinking, is this our man, Alf Boxall? However... They tried tracking him down, and they did track him down, and not only was he alive, but he <laughs> still had his copy of this book, The Rubaiyat. Uh, it's weird, isn't it? <laughs> Why was her number in this other book? If she owned a copy yeah. already and gave that to someone else, and the other person could produce that copy, yeah. it must it's have so been. weird. Yeah. It, it doesn't make much sense. They did determine, though, that there did seem to be some connection with Jesse Thompson and this man in question, because the autopsy of the Somerton man did find that he had distinguishing genetic features that would only be present in around 1% of the population. Um, Whoa. These features were identifiable by, he had a, an unusually shaped ear, and the fact that he was missing incisor teeth. And investigators noted these features were present in the son of Jesse Thompson, named Robin, funnily enough. <laughs> oh, I've got my incisors. So they believed at the time that she might have known more than she was letting on about the case due to how she reacted to seeing the, the cast of the, the dead man. But they had no justification apparently for ordering a DNA sample be carried out on the child. The DNA wasn't discovered uh, until 1956, was it? Well, that would um, be why as well, yeah. That's, th that's, that, would, that, would, that would make that a difference. That would definitely not help. But, um, <laughs> and it wasn't until the 1980s that I think DNA was used for a forensic criminal investigation. And sadly, Robin Thompson died in 2009. However, um, Jesse, his mother, did have a daughter named Kate who had some valuable insights into the case. So in 2013, she gave an interview to 60 Minutes where she claimed her mother told her that she knew who the Somerton man was but wouldn't reveal who he was. Um, she also claimed that her mother, Jesse, knew Russian and could have been a spy. Which is a what? bit of a... Oh, a, a that's a, a bombshell. Just drop that in there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So obviously that compounded the theories that the Somerton man was a spy and maybe mm -hmm. he, he knew Jesse because they were both spies and they had a child together. But before he died, Robin, he had a child with a fellow ballet dancer, because he was a ballet dancer, by the way, named Roma. And she put the child up for adoption and only recently reconnected with her. Rachel is the name of this child. Growing oh. up, Rachel never knew that she was possibly the granddaughter of the Somerton man. However, a researcher who's worked on this case named Derek Abbott, who I think we're going to be talking more about, uh, mm -hmm. got in touch with her, hoping to carry out a DNA test to find out if, you know, this bloodline is from the Somerton Man, and then they could definitively prove who the Somerton Man was. But it got a bit complicated because Derek and Rachel uh, fell in love and got married and had kids of their own. Aww. And they needed, at this point in time, a DNA sample of the Somerton Man to carry out a DNA test. Yeah. And that yeah. leads us up until 
you know, relatively recently where there's been a major breakthrough in this case. Well, it's been in the news just this past week. And in fact, there was more news today, this very day uh, at the time of recording. Derek Abbott, who is in fact a professor at the University of Adelaide, has announced that they've completed their DNA analysis. Although ironically, not because his petition to exhume the body to get a DNA sample was actually successful. Um, It was successful, but uh, the body is in such a condition that they weren't able to get any useful DNA from it. Instead, they were able to get some hairs from the death mask that had been pulled out by the plaster when they had done the cast of his face. And they got the hairs out of that and managed to, after a lot of work, because it had degraded quite a bit, get a DNA sample and then through some what looks like some really intense forensic gene- genealogical research identify a group of what four thousand people I think they said yeah, who might be related. Crazy. Yeah, that's a mad. That's that is one big yeah. family tree. Yeah, and then they've requested DNA samples and compared DNA samples uh, to the hair they got from the Sumpton man and found what they think is a match with the Webb family. And so Professor Derek Abbott has announced in this past week the name of the Somerton man is actually Carl or Charles Webb. And as far as we know about Charles Webb, uh, he, he was just an electrician, I think. Nothing yeah, particularly exotic poetry, about him. Well, that, that's what, that's he what was, you think yeah. spies are. You think yeah. they're just electricians they're somebody normal. and then an, an, an instrument maker as well, apparently. But yeah. what's interesting is that they don't have a photograph of Charles Webb. But today, Derek Abbott published a photograph from Charles Webb's brother, Roy, when he joined the Australian army in 1940 to fight in World War II. For his army file, they took some photos of him, like passport photos. To quote Professor Abbott, there appears to be a reasonable resemblance. The general shape of the face is the same, the hairline is the same, and in the army file, Roy Webb's eye color is listed as being hazel, and the Summerton man's eye color was hazel. Mm -hmm. And I looked it up, and apparently only 5% of the population has hazel eyes. I mean, the Summerton man is, of course, dead. Uh, but they look remarkably similar, don't they? I think there's something there, yeah. Mm. No, it definitely looks like they're onto something. It really does. Furthermore, when doing some research into Charles Webb, they found out he had a wife, Dorothy, um, and they got married October 1941. And in October 1951, there was a public notice put in a newspaper in Melbourne where Dorothy lived from Dorothy, and it was addressed to Charles Webb saying that she'd started divorce proceedings against her husband on the grounds of desertion. And the law in the UK, and I think Australian law at the time had basically just borrowed UK law, because obviously they used to be a colony. To qualify for desertion as grounds for divorce, the partners have to have been provably separated for two years continuously. Wind back the clock from 1951, two years, yeah, 1949, 1949, and yeah, end of 1948 <laughs> is when Sumter Man is found dead on a beach. You'd think that she'd just be able to look at the photos and go, yes, that's him. But were they published? I don't know if they were published well, in newspapers the question, at the time. Yeah, Because yeah. yeah. they sent photographs it was, it was, and fingerprints to law agencies all around the English-speaking world, didn't they? To yeah. the FBI, to mm. the UK's MI5 and things like that. Scotland it's widely Yard. publicised, yeah. But I don't know if they actually published mm. any of that in the general press for people to identify the body. Could the It Is Ended refer to the divorce? Ooh. It's still a bit weird though, isn't it? Because why mm. was that note it is finished because it's a, if it's a suicide or even if it's an assassination mm. this was found in his fob pocket which is like a secret pocket it, like it took them four months to even find this note mm. why why would he do that mm. why would be the attackers or him if it was a suicide like why would he not be clutching it in his hands or just in his his top pocket why would it be in a secret very pocket? odd if you ignore that for a moment and just look at this suggestion that it's charles webb so you got Charles Webb is married to Dorothy Webb. It's World War II. Maybe he gets recruited to be a spy. Yeah. Joe, trained to be a nurse, is perhaps also recruited to be a spy. She speaks Russian. Bit weird. They hook up. He gets her pregnant. She decides to... Well, we know this for a fact. She didn't complete her nurse training because because she got pregnant. And then she disappears. She moves to Adelaide. She shacks up with another man. She marries him. That's why she, her surname is Thomas. And she has a child who looks... Shares some peculiar genetic features with this man who's found on the beach. And he's only his body is just a few hundred meters from her house. And then his wife divorces him a couple of years later mm. when the allotted time has expired for desertion to be efficient, sufficient grounds for divorce. I think, yeah, they hooked up, they had a child, he decided he wasn't in love with his wife anymore, he goes to find this other woman, that's why her number is in the book. His clothing has no uh, 
labels on it for, for his name. And it was common yeah. practice at the time for you to put your name in your clothing. Professor Abbott suggests that the only uh, a common practice might be when you get secondhand clothes, which would have other people's names in, then you'd remove all the name tags. This may explain why, if he is Charles Webb, why he's got T. Keen's name on some of the clothes in his suitcase, because he may have just got a bunch of secondhand clothes from somebody else. And coincidentally, Charles Webb's sister, Frida, married a man called Gerald Keen, whose birth certificate says Thomas Gerald Keen. Oh, that could explain where the clothes came from. So he could be borrowing his brother-in-law's clothes to go smartly dressed to reconnect with the woman with whom he had an affair and a baby. What I don't get is why he's dead. Yeah, that, that's the, that's the mystery. That's the real mystery. I mean, who he is is one thing, but why he was there, like the whole everything surrounding it was just so strange. Like, yeah, the the spleen, like potential internal bleeding, but no signs of of actually of a murder, no signs of poisoning. Like, why is he on the beach or sat yeah. up as well in smart mm. clothes? It's, I mean, it, it looks like he's it's been staged of him. You know, he's been propped up there mm. by someone else. Like, doesn't look fact, like a, a self inflicted. I feel like the fact that the book was gotten rid of that could be either a suicide thing like or it could Mm. be you know the attacker doing that like i can imagine him tearing out that it is finished and just Mm. like tossing the book giving it like Mm. throwing it to someone else because who cares anymore it's it's in direct conflict with the fact that he hid the note in a secret pocket in his coat right it is yeah it does those two don't reconcile yeah, but maybe we could end it on a more positive note by saying uh, or acknowledging the South Australia Police's statement because um, apparently they have an ongoing investigation, which is one of the reasons that we haven't had a f- fully detailed uh, description of the the research published because Abbott, Professor Abbott doesn't want to interfere with the investigation. But the South Australia Police did issue a statement and they said in the statement that we are cautiously optimistic that this may provide a breakthrough. But I remember us discussing this case years and years ago. I think uh, the conclusion that we came to was, well, it's only a matter of time. There's a, this case actually has a very distinctive possibility that it may get yeah. solved. And here we are. Yeah. 